All right. Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is part of our continuing uh, Halloween themed series exploring Gnostic terrors, Gnostic horrors. And my guest uh, tonight is Kay Halloran. Did I get your last name right, Kay? Yes, you did. Yeah. So, uh, Kay Halloran uh, originally found their work um, with an article that they wrote uh, on uh, bloodknife.com called Gnostic Horror in the Fall of the History. So, uh, you can guess just by that title alone that uh, it is a uh, perfect for the programming that we're doing. However, uh, KZ seems to have uh, lots of interesting thoughts and sees many interesting connections to Gnosticism. So I, I think we have uh, you know more to talk about than just the article. Uh, and before we do dive into that, before we uh, uh, do embrace the terrors of the cosmos or the chaosmos, perhaps I should be saying, uh, <laughs> of course, Quick plug for uh, our Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic. Uh, we literally need your financial support to do the show. And you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that if you're worried about us doing too many piece pieces of media per month. We usually put five or six through there, and the rest are bonus. So actually, we often do a lot more than five or six, and then don't charge for them. So if you're... Uh, if you're a patron, if you're a patron, you're uh, helping bringing a lot of uh, Gnostic content into the world. Uh, you can do one-time donations at PayPal.com/Gnostic. And I understand if you can't help us out financially, these are particularly challenging times. So like and rate, like and review us and rate us on the podcatcher of your choice. Uh, uh, subscribe on YouTube. Tell people about the show. Share it on your social media. Take your favorite episode. Send it to a friend that you think would appreciate it. Okay, now that's the 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 commercial's over now that that terror now that that existential horror is over uh, okay um sorry i'm looking for my question sheet here well, let's start with some gnostic horror movies we actually have been talking about uh some gnostic horror movies on the show we have done shows where we kind of talked about some of our favorites uh we recently did an entire panel on bride of frankenstein but i i think it's a really fun topic and, and it's always a great way to illustrate what gnosticism is about when you find a really good one because you know you can show it to someone and be like actually you know what and, and plus there's a lot of sort of obscure gems out there in my opinion there's uh there's a lot more gnostic horror movies that, that, that people might realize so could you tell us about a few or a few of your favorites or a few that you'd like to think about or reflect well upon this topic uh sure uh i would love to um i think that uh where i the way i tried to approach uh, the idea of the gnostic within horror uh, was basically a reaction to Lovecraft, a sort of a paradigmatic figure within the horror genre, as sort of the father of what we today call cosmic horror, of this sort of idea that um, this sort of idea that there are things out in the universe that are so huge and uh, so impersonal. Uh, uh, forces that are just sort of totally inscrutable to human beings and which can just absolutely are almost indifferent to our suffering, indifferent to us, indifferent to our lives, and are just such uh, huge natural uh, weights on the human condition that they can just snuff us out overnight. And this is this sort of generated a lot of the Lovecraftian angst, the idea of the, the anxiety that you know, uh, as much as your personal life can be important to you, the people in your life can be important. There's something out on the horizon, you know, Cthulhu is going to come and your whole, your whole lives will be just inundated in, uh, you know, torrential flooding, the seas will rise. But at the end of the day to Cthulhu himself, it's almost as though he's getting out of the bathtub and trying to pick up his rubber ducky, you know, it's, there's a sense of remove. And what, um, as a horror writer, what sort of interests me is going into um, this genre and trying to come out with new themes or new ideas. And so there's, there's always this notion that the horror of the cosmic shouldn't be personal. And what I find interesting about the Gnostic element is that you, you come to this horrifying realization that it's not just out there, it's also in, it's of you, it's create, everything about you is tainted by this sort of, this cosmic material evil. And uh, that is sort of these, so, so really when I think about Gnostic uh, horror and when I think about Gnostic horror movies, 
what I was particularly looking for were films that had what I would call kind of a dystheistic element, uh, where there is, you know, you know, a lot of horror, I think, gets uh, denigrated as being nihilistic. So, for example, th this is uh, Roger Ebert criticizing uh, the Friday the 13th movies as this sort of nihilistic orgy of, of murder and, and killing these teenagers to show that life doesn't mean anything or whatever. And uh, I think that um, it, th this idea that there is no God in this universe, bad things happen to good people. And I think what I was looking for were movies where um, there is clearly a God and it's clearly evil. <laughs> and <laughs> so that was sort of the things that, that resonated with those themes. So I'll, I'll talk about a couple that I mentioned in the article. And there are certainly a number of different elements that I had, um, I, I sort of come to uh, in the intervening months, uh, certain movies I didn't really know about. Um, I think that uh, a big one that I would uh, immediately point out would be, uh, I, I'm quite impressed by a movie called uh, A Dark Song mm -hmm. um, that came out in 2017, uh, directed by Liam Gavin. And A Dark Song is sort of what I would call kind of a cult horror. Uh, it's a very interesting movie. It's got really uh, one of the most sort of interesting premises I've ever really seen in a horror movie where it's about uh, two people trying to do this, uh, the Abramellum ritual, uh, which I think if, if students of the occult are here, this is a, a very famous ritual from uh, the Middle Ages of sanctification, of the idea that to, to draw closer to God, you must in some way purify yourself through these ordeals and through this grueling ritual process where they, they lock themselves in a house for a number of months. And at the same time, they're being tempted by all these kinds of forces. And although I think this movie isn't, um, it doesn't posit a, a totally evil deity. It certainly posits one that is vengeful and horrible and willing to really put these people through uh, a terrifying ordeal uh, and punish every mistake they make. And so this was a movie that immediately uh, appealed to me in this sort of a sense. Um, I can see echoes of the Gnostic in, in many things, even if they're not necessarily terribly overt. Um, so, for example, I, I think that there is certainly a Gnostic sense to, uh, I don't know if, if uh, any uh, followers will be familiar with Twin Peaks uh, as sort of, not necessarily a film, but a series, uh, although I guess uh, Fire Walk With Me is a particularly notable example of a, a great film. But uh, I think Lynch, especially uh, as a director, is dealing an awful lot with uh, a manichaeus a Manichaic conflict between good and evil. But the way that evil is sort of posited, I think, in Twin Peaks is as this, uh, almost the, these gravitational objects that just sort of twist everything around them, you know, almost interdimensionally, and, and in the personal lives of the characters. And so, uh, especially with um, the return to Twin Peaks, which uh, was the, the special series that Lynch did a couple of years ago to sort of finalize these, um, these plots that he had put in motion in the original series, we see this interesting emphasis on uh, a horror that is not necessarily tangible, but is clearly within the material world and within reality. And I think especially he's emphasizing the notion of time, of... Um, uh, of age, of, of the way things slowly change, you get away from you. And as at time, as this really the last thing we can almost really conceive of as a deity, as something that we have absolutely no control over as human beings. Um, uh, all right. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that, that you mentioned uh, uh, Lynch and Twin Peaks. So I often see a lot of Gnosticism in his work. I uh, and I'm trying not to do that with works I really like as read-ins, but I, I think a strong case could be made, and particularly with Twin Peaks: The Return, which he considered a movie. He he he's, yes. he, he has stated it's a film, uh, even though it's uh, eight, 17 hours, 19 hours. Uh, but uh, okay, again, we were already uh, off air, you know, talking about perhaps some future topics. But uh, I, I, for a long time, I've been wanting to do a a panel, maybe even a mini series, maybe even a mini series panel on Lynch, because approaching his work for for me is so intimidating. Partly because I, I love it so much, but I, I definitely agree with you. And I'm really glad you brought that up as as an 
example. And I found uh, Twin Peaks Return, Twin Peaks 3, whatever you want to call it, to be particularly Gnostic, to, to really have a lot of Gnostic themes. Absolutely, yeah. And and clearly with the idea, uh, you, you can see Laura Palmer in, in her, in the total, the total mythology of her figure as really being an Aeon, almost yeah. explicitly. Um, uh, another another movie that I think is has a very important place I think within the Gnostic canon uh, is probably 2001's Frailty, uh, directed by the late Bill Paxton, uh, and I think starring Matthew McConaughey and uh, Bill Paxton himself. Uh, and it's it's a very interesting film because it sort of takes this notion that you will see in actually uh, a few very. Uh, how shall I say, uh, very lowbrow American action movies, uh, vi especially vigilante movies, such as, for example, like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen The Boondock Saints, uh, yeah. which I'm not particularly a fan of, but the movie sort of posits this notion that these two characters are chosen by God to be vigilantes and to take out the bad guys. And, uh, and so it's this kind of great, um, this ethos that, you know, uh, the good in America can be uh, achieved through violence, through taking out uh, people that you see as evil or undesirable in almost uh, a literalistic, cosmic, uh, religious sense. And I think what's interesting about frailty as almost a response to this kind of trope uh, that you occasionally see in these movies is that frailty takes this premise to its absolutely most horrifying conclusion about uh, how really terrifying it would be if God put a bounty on individual people's heads and it was really ambiguous as to whether anybody was really doing any good or not. And uh, and, and it's also just a story about generational trauma in, in really interesting ways. It's, it's a fascinating film that I think didn't really get recognized in its day. And I hope any any people with really an interest in the Gnostic, uh, I think that's certainly one I would check out. Um, I have a couple more examples uh, of just film. Uh, one, one that I saw recently uh, that really blew me away, and, and I, I really have to give credit to uh, Kurt, my editor at Blood Knife, for pointing this out to me. Unfortunately, uh, a little too late to put in the article, but I finally got around to seeing John Carpenter's uh, Prince of Darkness. The other night and was really blown away and felt terrible that I hadn't included it in my article uh, because it's this fascinating um, it's really this fascinating movie uh, it, it's it's got a lot of interesting ideas and a lot of an interesting aesthetic uh, it, it's sort of the first uh, I guess it's after the thing but it's within it's within the apocalypse trilogy of John Carpenter so if you've seen in the mouth of madness and the thing this is meant to be sort of within that same vein and Prince of Darkness is essentially sort of a movie where uh, a, a theoretical physicist is approached by uh, the Vatican and basically told that there's this sort of order of monks who have been holding on to this religious object that is now changing somehow and the world is changing around it. And so this physicist and his team of graduate students have to go in and analyze it and try to figure out what's going on. And, uh, and, and at the same time, everything is sort of being bounded up in religious prophecy. Uh, all these kind of hideous things are happening in the world. Um, all these characters who he introduces are sort of being confronted on their own personal issues in ways that are, are just kind of unsettling. And it does posit this idea of an entity that is manipulating the world around it on, a, on a, like a cellular level. Uh, and is sort of and is trying to sort of break free, and the question is whether or not these um, these intrepid people can stop this demiurge from bursting forth and uh, changing the world to its own whims. And I think that that that's just an excellent. I mean, it might be the most gnostic movie of my bunch that I've really I found in film. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do really love uh, John Carpenter, and that, that's one I've missed out on. And, and it's funny, I, I mentioned that we did a panel uh, with uh, uh, for, for our Halloween programming uh, <laughs> with a bunch of people uh, talk about uh, Bride of Frankenstein, but I think when the camera wasn't rolling, or maybe it's there at the end, 
uh, uh, people started talking about uh, uh, Prince of Darkness as, as perhaps a future panel show or a future one to cover next uh, next year. So, uh, it, so the you have you have a number of votes of confidence behind your Gnostic interpretation, Kay, and it uh, it sounds like it's definitely something I've got to check out before the the, the thirty first uh, and and get it somewhere in the uh, the programming for uh, uh, an upcoming uh, uh, talk gnosis. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, and and there's a number of there's a number of sort of works of literature that I, I sort of discuss in the article, uh, and I I also just want to give a shout out to an, a new author who I hadn't really uh, found out about while I was reading the the art art uh, writing the article, but uh, I would say you know uh, my friends uh, were able to kind of point me towards a lot of uh, interesting work from Thomas Ligotti. Uh, where Thomas Ligotti is a, a very interesting modern horror writer uh, who is is famous for being plagiarized by True Detective. So if you if you dig um, Matthew McConaughey's monologues in True Detective, they're almost straight out of Thomas Ligotti's sort of brooding, uh, seemingly nihilist sort of picture of the world. But uh, behind that, what he really likes to talk about is sort of there, there's a sense of humor to his work where it's almost as though the world is going to be smothered by not not a kind of uh, ferocious terror or anything like that, but almost a sort of bland corporate boredom mm. that is just uh, through through its sort of bemusing uh, trivialities is just going to smother us all. And uh, so there are a number of his stories that make use of this very interesting sort of faceless, uh, you know, you know, administration, the board, the higher ups, uh, and uh, who are running this sort of world company that sort of extends beyond the protagonist's ability to uh, really even ontology, you know, even ability to kind of uh, imagine a world outside of it. And this is sort of an interesting thing he plays with, as well as a couple of stories that I think are very explicitly Gnostic. Um, there's a great one called The Mystics of Muhlenberg, uh, which has this fantastic quote um, that I think will just just kind of illustrate what it what it kind of is. It's about a uh, an occult seeker who meets this sort of mystic, and uh, as as this uh, this moment, he sort of explains. I once knew a man who claimed that overnight all the solid shapes of existence had been replaced by cheap substitutes: trees made out of poster board, houses built of colored foam, whole landscapes composed of hair clippings. His own flesh, he said was now just so much putty. <laughs> it's the sense that we all have kind of of living in a world that feels like it's being built of cheaper and cheaper material and it sort of uh, seems more flimsy, but it's almost sort of encasing us. Uh, and uh, and he also he also wrote a great story called The Nethys Furial, which I think is almost a... A uh, classic Lovecraftian tale in a lot of ways. It's almost it's almost stripped down to a deconstruction, but it it's sort of the premise is sort of the idea of a character who discovers who's an archaeologist who sort of discovers this ancient Roman uh, cult that is worshiping an idol, and uh, called the Nethyscurial. And as he learns about this idol, he uh, he discovers that it is actually in many ways. Um, evil it is and it, and it was that this cult was destroyed and this whole thing was sort of buried underground and so he finally he rescues this image of of this uh pandemonic as uh Ligotti describes it entity and uh th this is sort of a great this is like almost a, a textbook demiurgic sort of uh a tale that i i really think anybody interested in this stuff would really enjoy yeah um, and then I, I want to give a huge shout out. I think if anybody is interested in Gnostic horror literature, they should really check out um, uh, Scott Jones. Uh, he is a um, he is currently uh, Scott Jones is currently a horror writer who has just written a book called Stonefish. Uh, and Stonefish is this excellent. It's almost it's got aspects of gothic, but it's also got this kind of wonderful. Um, modern absurdity it's it's really a story about kind of the absurdity i think of our lives and of pop culture and of culture in general right now uh where uh it, it posits sort of a gnostic horror uh the idea of conjectured manufactured realities and it does it through almost like a gothic villain 
character, uh, but in in the context of a tech billionaire who uh, th this is sort of, he does this great sort of riff on uh, all these terrible articles that you'll find where all these, all these tech people are talking about how, oh, is the world just a simulation, you know? And uh, I, I, I really wonder what the sort of ideological intent of all these articles are, but this is a wonderful book that sort of tries to take that as a horror premise in really interesting ways. And I, I would really appreciate if people would go out and buy this book, Stonefish, because, um, Jones really deserves a lot more uh, uh, eyes, and I think this audience would absolutely love it. It's fantastic. So um, those are just two literary examples I want to put out, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Well, the, before before we pivot to to some more examples of, of Gnostic works, just like a light little easy question, an even lighter topic, but uh, the problem with evil um mm. when you were uh, you spent some time studying the archaeology and philosophy of of greco-roman egypt and and you see how neoplatonism gnosticism and hermeticism three movements that are really siblings to each other uh have a sort of a, a powerful relationship exploration of the problem of evil could you elaborate on on that uh yeah i i spent a lot of I, I was particularly interested in Gnosticism, especially coming from uh, really just a raw reading when I was a teenager of the Nag Hammadi uh, texts, where I, I read, you know, Thunder Perfect Mind, uh, the the Gospel of Norea, I think, is, is my favorite, uh, all these weird, you know, subversive mythologies. And I got I got fascinated with those, and then when I got when I became an undergraduate, I started really reading uh, Plotinus and Neoplatonism, and then carrying that through to the Corpus Hermeticum uh, and Hermes Trismegistus and all this stuff. And I I spent a long time trying to sort of um, trying to just understand these major uh, streams of your Western thought and and occult history and mysticism. And where I came out with was I, I was really trying to think of these movements as commenting on one another, because I would, you know, I would go to Plotinus's um, criticism of the Gnostic against the Gnostics, his old little uh, treatise, where I think most of the umbrage he takes with the Gnostics is that they're uh, anti-natalist. I think that's really his main, you know, his main critique as a pagan philosopher at the time. But uh, on the other hand, the Gnostics were, I think, in a lot of ways, a response to this kind of, uh, this kind of, middle platonic sort of zeitgeist in late antiquity, where I get a sense that what differentiates these three major streams in uh, Greco-Roman um, Egypt is really that they're all, I, th I think the way to understand their interrelationship is as responses to the problem of evil, basically. Hmm. And the notion that there's something deficient about the material world. There's something that doesn't really there's some reason we can't all be gods, you know, living in matter. There's something deficient here. And so um, what I think that Neoplatonism is kind of uh, eventually settles on is this notion that evil is sort of the result of error. It's not a particular intent. It's, it's that when, uh, when spirit becomes so divorced from the one, becomes so, um, how shall I say, extruded from cosmic oneness uh that it shouldn't go you know uh whereas then when you when you look at the sort of the radical op opposing philosophy that clearly the neoplatonists were a little anxious about you go to uh you go to the gnostics you go to uh Nagam the Ma nagamati gospels you go to these things and there is instead this radical um this radical refusal to accept that answer to say like no there is something about uh, there's something about matter that is purposefully evil, that does does keep us from being one with God, and is there to torture us, and is meaningless, feels meaningless, feels like it doesn't it, it doesn't inform us in any kind of real uh, beneficial way, and is and is preventing us from finding God, and and through secret knowledge, through our our understanding of uh, the true gospel, you know, we can we can sort of ascend. We have, but we have to do it uh subversively we have to go against the grain and so i see these as two kind of antagonistic a thesis and antithesis even though i'm not i i can't really tell which probably came first in terms of actual schools or movements uh and then from both of those i see then hermeticism 
as sort of the third major pull, the third mystical pull that I think emerges out of Greco-Roman Egypt as this notion that maybe, um, maybe things are deficient. Maybe the material world isn't as it should be right now. Maybe, maybe there are certain things about it that are seem to us as, you know, individual human souls to be not working, you know, to, to, to be not reaching its full potential. But it sees this as an opportunity, which I think is the interesting part. This, this notion of so much of hermeticism seems interested in co-creation with the cosmos and like the idea of um, the idea that mankind is can can be one with god through its understanding and in a way our separateness is an opportunity it's it our material circumstances even if they are deficient is a canvas for us to actually become divinity and and experience be able to actually create and become one with god through um using our separation to create things to be like gods um and so i've i've sort of over the years, I sort of came up with this understanding of these three schools as being like, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And of course, that isn't really a historical explanation. I, th I think you can see they're much more, they're much more patchy. Uh, they're much more interrelated, clearly. They're, they're obviously in comment with one another, uh, in contest with one another in different places. But I think that overall, this was sort of how I, I tried to tie everything together at the end of my education. And uh, has just, uh, a lot of people, I think, got the notion from me writing the Gnostic Horror article that I am myself uh, a, a doomer, a Gnostic, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a person. But uh, I, I'm probably more on the hermetic end at this point. But uh, I, I just have always found Gnosticism to be really something I respect deeply for not taking, uh, not taking guff from, you know, the empire. Like, like people not really willing to accept the lives that were handed to them at that time in a weird way, you know, wanting to find some genuine spiritual meaning. Uh, so that's always interested me about uh, the, the whole stream. And uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely a topic, uh, again, that we should we should talk about sometime uh, in the future, because it is it is fascinating uh, to see the relationships between these three influential movements, to see them influencing each other, reacting to each other, and also sort of figuring out where that goes. And uh, I really see have come to see Neoplatonism as being in a dialectical relationship with Gnosticism, uh, with Gnosticism giving birth to, to Neoplatonism, with Neoplatonism really being a, uh, a reaction in many ways to Gnosticism. Mm. Uh, there's even the theory that Plotinus, his parents were, were Gnostics and that he was raised a mm. Gnostic. Um, so, uh, however, the, the, you know, the proof for, for that theory is, uh, is, 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 it's, it's all very conjecture. Minor. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's all conjecture. Anyways, uh, but, um, uh, moving on, uh, and just briefly, again, talk about future topics, although this has already been such an amazing show and, and I, and I know our, our viewers and listeners are getting a lot out of it, right? Because, uh, you're watching this because you're a horror fan and you're finding out about all this, this interesting stuff, uh, about your favorite horror movies and, or you're watching this because you're a Gnostic and Halloween is coming up and now you have a uh, the terror uh, film festival planned out for yourself. But um, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the manga Berserk. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, just briefly tell us why you think it's Gnostic and then maybe sometime we can get you back on the show to really dive oh. into it. And maybe if you can tell us what, what, what the best podcast about, about that, that piece is. So if you, if you can answer those questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so the reason I had brought up Berserk very briefly in my article was because it is this major, I think a, the Gnostic masterpiece, the Gnostic epic, I think of our times, I would say. Um, Berserk uh, ha has, was going for about 32 years and just this year, very unexpectedly in the spring, uh, the author Kentaro Miura uh, unfortunately passed away uh, very shortly after I'd, I'd published my article. And although I kind of talk a little bit about the, the way that it uses Gnostic themes, uh, I, it's, it's such a huge text. Um, it's 32 years of, of someone's life poured into the best story they could possibly tell. And it is this dark fantasy epic that really, it, it's medieval. It, it doesn't take place in some kind of mythic age like uh, Tolkien. It's, it's not taking place in the Viking age. It's not taking place in, in you know, the, the age of heroes. 
it's taking place in this uh, deeply historical, deeply human time. It's it's sort of modeled after the 100 Years War. There's all mercenaries running around everywhere on this, this terrible, just war-torn uh, Europe uh, in the Middle Ages. There's nothing... People, people's lives are just sort of awful and meaningless. And this, this great uh, guts, this great protagonist, this great almost Conan-like hero is born into this awful, this awful world. And he just tries to get by and find himself until he finally meets uh, a man who really believes in something and believes in changing the world and believes in becoming something else. And uh, at the same time, Berserk doesn't really have a lot of overt, at first, supernatural elements. At least when you when you look at the story chronologically, as far as the characters, the the it's very much just a medieval story, like Game of Thrones, about class politics and about a war and about all these things. But slowly, as the narrative sort of unfolds, the cracks begin to kind of show, and these demons sort of enter the world, and and suddenly you see this notion that the world has actually been being manipulated by supernatural hands the whole time. Hmm. And the problem is these hands aren't necessarily um, the devil or Satan, but are in fact divine, are in fact, you know, do come from God and, and from all these things. And so there's this wonderful, there's this wonderful, um, and maybe this is a spoiler, but I think this will get anybody in, into Gnosticism into it. There's sort of a lost chapter of Berserk, a chapter 89 uh, called Lords of the Abyss, where one of the characters actually meets God, meets meets sort of the, the of this world, and uh, an entity that calls itself the idea of evil. And it's mm -hmm. a demiurge that has been conjured by humanity's need uh, to explain the absurdity of their own deaths, the, the meaninglessness of their own lives created this huge engine that moves history through human suffering and through just, you know, just, just uh, arranging souls and arranging people and, and tearing people apart. And so after this sort of traumatic meeting with the divine, uh, our hero Guts, who is again, this Conan figure, he's this guy with a huge sword, is just totally traumatized by the realization that his entire everything in existence is against him and is out to kill him and is being manipulated by this thing that he can't even really understand but he still has to go out and fight and uh he's he's really got there's somebody he really needs to get some revenge on and that's sort of this 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 great epic that lasts uh lasted 32 years of this man's life it's the best it's the best piece of media that I think handles Gnosticism uh, that I've I've seen. So uh, my friends and I have a podcast where we're actually reading through it. So if you want to join us on a, a massive reread that we're going to be doing, I think, over the next couple of years, uh, we are The Pod Hand. And it is myself and uh, my friends uh, Maddie Lewis, who is a, a gothic uh, dark fantasy writer, and J.R. Bolt who is this uh, wonderful, this, this wonderful little part of film Twitter and a great uh, novelist himself who has yet to publish. And so the three of us are kind of going through Kentaro Miura's Berserk, talking about a lot of other works that informed it and a lot of works that were influenced by it. A lot of things that are in that vein of horror and dark fantasy and grimdark. But um, we are especially happy to talk about this sort of great thematic this thing that really made me enjoy it all the more because I'd never seen anything be that, uh, you know, you could talk about nihilism, but to say the world is not just meaningless, but evil is really something that I thought was fantastic about it. So yeah. uh, I, anybody who would love to join, uh, listen to that and, and join with us. We're, we're trying to do weekly episodes now. We've just started over the summer. So okay, be very fantastic. excited. Fantastic. Yeah. So pod hand, and do you mind shouting out your, your other plugs too? I've been throwing them on the screen, but for those who listen as, as listen to this as a podcast. Yeah. So I am, a, I am a horror writer, uh, and I'm also a, a low fantasy writer as well, but horror is sort of what I've been doing. I have an audio fiction podcast called Grimoire Nights, where I do, I think I would call it really a cult horror. I try to take ideas from um, pagan antiquity, from archaeology, and from occultism, and, and try to kind of spin them into real horror that isn't just sort of uh, making things up as it goes along, but it's trying to take the ideas and make them really terrifying and interesting. Uh, and right now there's a, um, a feature-length 
uh, archaeological horror episode. If you ever wanted a doomed archaeological expedition with thorough research and just a lot of uh, dark, scary atmosphere and vibes, uh, I have a, a story called Herder's Hill that I think people would really enjoy on the Grimoire Nights podcast that I've narrated and scored. And I have a, I do have a Gnostic horror story coming called Zeitgeist that deals with a lot of uh, John D and Enochian influences, as well as a lot of interesting turn of the century, uh, you know, 1900s uh, politics and uh, sort of um, culture. A lot of, uh, I, I noticed you recently had somebody who was interested in uh, symbolism, some uh, symbolist painting and, and this this sort of turn. So if you're interested in that, I'm, I'm doing a riff on that. Uh, cool. And that'll come out, I think, in a, in a couple of months, uh, sometime in the winter or early spring. Extremely cool. Well, thanks so much, Kay. Uh, before we go, I'll, I'll quickly do my pu plug, which is for mileendmeditation.substack.com. Uh, my day job, one of my day jobs is working as a meditation coach and uh, mindfulness instructor uh, in a secular context with the psychological secular practice of meditation and mindfulness. So just to get myself some more teaching practice and to give back since, you know, I have to charge slash get paid for my other work uh, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time, uh, you can go to myelandmeditation.substack.com and there you will see uh, a link to meditate with us. So we have a pretty good crowd of people that come out and it's uh, about 45 minutes to an hour of meditation, which is a lot, but we flow through a few different practices. You know, we take breaks. It's, uh, it's a really great experience. It's, it's good for both uh, those who are new to meditation and those uh, who have a lot of experience in meditation and those looking to build a practice. So come on out to that. Uh, Kay, it's been amazing. Uh, thank you so, so, so much. And uh, I'm sure we will be in touch in the future. And uh, we definitely would want to talk to you more uh, about some of these uh, topics that we've raised tonight. Thanks, Kay. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, have a wonderful Halloween. Have a wonderful, <laughs> a spooky season uh, all <laughs> same, around. Same to you. Uh, don't, don't get too scared. So <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. Everything is good. <laughs> all right.